Thanks, Philip. It's, uh, it's great to be back at Techsylvania. Thanks, Juana and Vlad, for inviting me back. It's great to see a bigger audience this year, and it looks like next year we might need to be in the Opera House as well. So last year, I spoke about animals. I spoke about hippos and dingoes. And hidden behind that pretext was a talk about how we should use data to influence our product decisions. This year, I'm going to move up a level and talk about a subject that's near and dear to me, ice cream, my favorite food. And under the guise of ice cream, I'm going to talk about the minimum delightful experience and how that should be the new way we look at what's traditionally looked at as the minimum viable product. So some background on myself, just for, for context. I've been a successful founder and a failed founder. There's at least one company on there that nobody will possibly recognize, and that's the one that failed. I've worked at small companies that have had phenomenal growth, and I've worked at big companies that have stagnated and lapsed into incre incrementalism. And, and all of that diverse set of experiences is what goes into what I'm talking about today. I don't pretend to provide gospel, but hopefully the next 15, 20 minutes will give you something to think about as you all go out and build your own products. So how many of you here, not that I can actually see anyone, how many of you here are looking to create or build something new, whether it's your own company or a new product in, your, in, in another company? I'm guessing that's most people. So there's a lot of ideas going around. It's very easy to get started these days, right? The, the legend of two people in a garage is, has never been truer than it is today. But uh, the, the challenge is not the ideation. The challenge is the execution. And that's where a lot of us get unstuck. The questions I'm going to try and answer over the next 15 minutes are, are to give you a little bit of a framework on that initial execution. What is it that I should go to market with? When is that product ready to go to market? And the often ignored, how should I go about taking it to market? Because it's not always as simple as just building it. So the obvious answer to this, if my, my slides are working, is build a minimum viable product, right? I think many of you in the audience are probably thinking, great, that's the end of the talk. He's, he's answered the question, and there's not a lot more to it. And you'd be somewhat correct, but I'm not here to repudiate the minimum viable product, but I believe it needs to be extended and thought about a little differently. The challenge with the minimum viable product is we tend to laser focus in on viability and on the idea of a product as a set of features. And the problem that arises is the practice of that is often terrible. So take a look at this ice cream here, right? This is what most of us tend to end up with when we think about building a minimum viable product. I'd wager there's no one in the room looking at that and thinking, yes, I, I want to take a bite out of that ice cream cone. I can imagine that this is going to be a great culinary experience. I eat ice cream for breakfast sometimes, and I can't see myself eating that. This just isn't really good enough. But before we consider what it's going to take to be good enough as a minimum delightful experience, I want to actually set the context for why we're doing this in the first place. There is one reason, and really one reason only, that you're going after this with, with what you build, and it's product market fit. That is the one single thing you're after. If you actually get that right, you will win. Everything else follows. It's important, I think, here to distinguish between problem solution fit and product market fit. So I'll do that by way of example. Friendster, MySpace, High Five, Orkut, you've all possibly heard of these now defunct social networks. Every one of them nailed problem solution fit. But Facebook came along and nailed product market fit, and the rest is really history. So to think about product market fit, um, I, I don't know if a lot of you do jigsaw puzzles. I have two young children who do them. And I've watched them progress as they've grown older as to how they do the puzzles. And, and that works into a great analogy for looking at how you should look at product market fit. So when my oldest child was about three, the way she did jigsaw puzzles was she'd pick up a piece and essentially brute force try to stick it in the puzzle, right? It didn't really fit, but she'd squish it in there. And the end result was partial destruction of the piece and partial destruction of the puzzle. Nothing really worked, but she made something stick together. As she grew older, logic started to sink in, and she started you know, separating out the edges, separating out the corners, organizing everything into their little colored sections. And essentially, before actually building the puzzle, she'd planned out where every single piece would fit. 
And then she'd turn around to the puzzle table, and her younger sibling had taken it over with a train set. And essentially, the point I'm making there, the market had escaped her before she was ready to actually go and build her product. As you get older and beyond that, you actually find a, a balance in between these, where you do a little bit of planning up front, but you iterate through, right? As you take each piece of the puzzle, you put it in, you try and fit it, and you say, yep, I need a little bit more blue here, and maybe the shoulder needs to be a little wider. And you go and find the next piece, and two or three iterations in, you get that fit. So the minimum delightful experience. The pursuit of product market fit is why I advocate for that. It's just two words that I've changed, but language really determines, the words we use determine how we respond and act, and the difference between a delightful experience and a viable product is significant. You're building for people, right? You're making a, a human connection. Viable products don't resonate, delightful experiences do. Best way to exemplify this is with another ice cream. So compare this to the first ice cream cone. They both check the box of vanilla, scoop of vanilla ice cream and a cone. And you put them side by side, and the difference starts to become apparent. When I look at the minimum delightful experience on the right, I think, yes, I could take a bite of that. And I start to imagine you know, that magic instant freezing chocolate sauce that you can put on it, the sprinkles, the wafers. And, and you start to build a picture of what could evolve out of this. So to break this down, I want to take the, the three words, minimum delightful experience, one by one, and I'll go, the, go through them in reverse. So starting with experience, this is a really critical one as compared with product, and it's a, it's a mindset shift that we have to undertake. Those of you who are out there thinking, yes, I'm going to build a great new product, don't. Don't build a product, build an experience. The, the difference is that products, product thinking tends to result in building out a set of features. You check off requirements and you deliver against them. An experience is holistic. It embraces the consumer and the consumer embraces you. If you do that, what you'll find starts to happen is that your consumers will become part of your team. They will understand and appreciate why they're using this experience and start to see the potential for themselves, and they will help you drive to the, to the end vision that you're aiming for. So as an example, take the case of shopping for glasses. I notice about half the audience here are wearing glasses. Now, typically, from a product standpoint, bringing glasses shopping online, you'd set up a store, you'd order a pair of glasses, and they'd show up, right? Boom, done. But think about the experience when you go into a store and shop for that pair of glasses, right? You, you try on all the different frames, you look at them in the mirror, you think about how they make you feel, think about how they make you look, and you settle on something that's just right. Understanding that experience is something that Warby Parker, I don't know how many people are familiar with that company, absolutely nailed. They don't sell you the product of glasses, they sell you and they immerse you into the entire experience of purchasing a pair of glasses. And they do it in a box, right? So it, it's actually remarkably simple, the difference between product and experience there. And, and think about what Warby Parker would have learned if they just shipped you a single pair of glasses. The, the market learning they'd have got would have been something along the lines of, yes, make this as cheap as possible, and I'll buy it from you versus the other guy. Instead, they delivered an experience, and you know, the, the results are there to see. Delightful. Very simple word, evoking emotion. That's what this is all about. And the key here is to really, whatever it is that you do as you build your experience, do it really well. We live in an era of consumer choice. You don't have to create delight by creating hundreds of different features in your product. That's not what evokes that emotion in people. Create one or two, figure out the ones that are going to mean something, and do them absolutely beautifully. And it's important to say, talk about that, that doing them beautifully doesn't just mean a visual experience that's delightful, but it can be the whole interaction and the immersive experience that's delightful. Create wonder or make people go, wow, right? It's, it's like when a child sees a remote control for the first time and figures out it can switch the, the television on. The, the expression on their face and what's going through their minds, that's what you want to create in your users with your delightful experience. So take the example of the Nest thermostat. 
right? This is absolutely delightful. It's not because of what it does, right? Thermostats have been around forever. It's how it does it and how it makes you feel. I mean, for me, that's, that's almost like looking at that ice cream cone. You just want to touch it. You want to play with it. You want to see what happens when you use it. And, and it's interesting, right? They, they went into a very well-defined market. So actually, this, this thermostat has a lot of functionality and capability behind it, but they transformed what that does. Take a look at this Honeywell thermostat that I have up there. It has the same capabilities as the Nest thermostat, in fact, probably more. If any of you have ever tried to use one of these things, one thing I can assure you that you've never felt is any form of delight whatsoever. And, uh, you know, these thermostats have been around for 20, 30 years in this form. They really haven't changed, right? In that whole time, Honeywell hasn't learned an awful lot about product market fit, and that's proven in the fact that the product hasn't altered. So delightful experiences are actually the easy part of this. The, the hardest thing of all of this is keeping things to a minimum. It sounds simple, but it's really, really difficult. The possibilities when you're thinking about your product or your service that you're, you're building are endless, right? As you start thinking about it, especially as a founder, you start understanding all these personal use cases, all these corner cases, and then these corners of corner cases, and every one of them individually sounds like, well, I need to solve that. I need to get that figured out. Now, minimum doesn't necessarily mean minimal. I don't always say solve just one thing, but what you really need to get to is the smallest self-contained experience that's going to allow you in a delightful way to assess product market fit. Again, we keep coming back to that. So a great example of that is a company called Robinhood. Um, I, th I think they may be US only right now. They just launched a few months ago to the public for stock trading. You know, it's free, simple stock trading. There's a hundred other services out there that allow you to trade stock. But what these guys have done is absolutely brilliant. And I think testament to that is the millions of users they've already acquired in that process. It's mobile only. You can buy stock and you can sell stock. That's it. There are no options, there are no margin calls, there's no reinvestment of dividends, there's, there's absolutely nothing else to the experience. They have made it that simple and, and minimal. Now, when you look at that experience, you know, my, one of my first thoughts was, well, okay, is this a great example to use because it doesn't look delightful? But, but I thought about that some more, and it goes to the point I made earlier that Delight, again, is not just in the visual interface, but it's the interaction and experience. And the magic here is in the simplicity of trading stock. If you have enough money in your account, you go to the page of a stock, and there's a buy button, and you buy. If you don't, the button's not there. The, the whole process is simplified like it's never been before, and the results are telling. So here's another company that we all know and love, and considered to be experts at keeping it simple. This is Google's, Google's homepage when they first launched on the Stanford campus in 1997. And this is Google's homepage, you know, 20, wow, 20 years later. And it hasn't changed a lot. It's simple, right? And we look at this and think, Google, great at doing very simple, focused, minimum experiences. Not always true. So how many of you remember Google Wave or ever used it? Fascinating product, right? So Google launched this in 2009, and their vision was essentially to bring every possible human interaction into one single product. And it's actually a great vision, right? So sometimes you hear Mark Zuckerberg talk, and he's got the same sort of vision underlying a lot of what Facebook is doing. But what Google completely failed to do was adhere to actually any of the three words in minimum delightful experience. There was nothing you couldn't do in Google Wave. Email, photos, video, instant messenger, voice call, video calls, play games, you could play chess, you could do it all. And what happened when it launched, despite all the hype and excitement and the fact that it had the muscle of Google behind it, people didn't understand what it was for, why they should be using it, or what it was really going to become and how it was going to fit into their experience of life. And where's Google Wave now? Well, it doesn't exist anymore. That's how difficult this is, right? It's, it's difficult for Google, a company we all know and admire, and rightly so, to get that right. So one more thing I want to add around experience is that when we talk about the experience that we build, 
It's not just in the product. It's not just in the tangible interface. It's the story you tell all around that, that product and service. And, and this is critical when you think about how you take this to market. You can't just stick your, your product out there. You've got to convey to people why they should use it, what it's going to do for them. And, and again, you're trying to make that emotional connection with people. You're, you're, you're solving a problem for human beings, and you've got to connect with them on that human level. If you can really do that with every, every word you speak and write, every picture, every product video you make, you can achieve that sort of gestalt with it. And when the, sum of the, part, when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, then you've achieved something special. So coming back to the ice cream, if you walk away from here with, with all the big ideas and visions and dreams that you have, remember this ice cream cone. Think about starting with that minimum delightful experience and tell a great story around it when you first take it to market. If you do that, you'll get your users, your consumers, your customers on board with you as, as almost part of your team and your army driving towards your vision. And when that happens, you'll be able to realize something like this. So this is just for the ice cream fanatics in the room. I was in New Zealand a couple of months ago, and I discovered this place called Giapo's Ice Cream Parlor. You've never seen anything like it. They, they make that in front of you. And it's, it's the realization of the vision around what started with a simple ice cream cone. And if you take this approach, that's what I think you'll be able to do with your products. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rohan. So if I ever start an ice cream company, I'll definitely get you on the board of advisors. Yeah, I, I should be. I just want to be a taster. <laughs> OK. That's great. So while we're getting our next uh, speaker ready, we'll take uh, one quick question from the audience. So whoever has the question, raise their hand. Yeah. OK. Hi, this is Ovidio from Today's Software Magazine. Uh, can you tell us a minimum delightful uh, uh, application that you design or you were involved in? Uh, there's a so, question. So let, let me repeat. The question yes. was, if you have a minimal delightful application that you personally designed. <laughs> because it's not about theory, it's yeah. about practice. Nobody wants to use anything that I designed, but um, with, with the team, I think a couple of, couple of good examples I can give you, and I can give you examples that failed as well. So Crickinfo, which is part of ESPN now, um, was something I started a long, long time ago. Feels like another lifetime. And it is now a full-blown media entity for the sport of cricket with scores and interviews and video and text and articles and everything else. But we, we started by looking at one very simple thing, which was live scoring updates on the internet. This was in the early 1990s now. And there was clamor for a whole bunch of other features and, and all kinds of things you could possibly put in there. But what we did really well was stay focused on that one thing and iterate through that. And once we had an audience engaged with that, we could build up features beyond that. Does that answer the question? And I'll be upstairs in the oh, oh, third yes. floor room. I'm happy to talk through some of the failed attempts at that as well. So Ovidio definitely, uh, definitely should do an interview and publish this, because he has the biggest uh, software so, magazine in Cluj. Thank so you. we should definitely lead that conversation further. Thanks very much, right. Rohan. Thank you very much.